Lewis Hamilton. Anyone know that name? <laughs> Young men usually know that name. Lewis Hamilton. <laughs> Lewis Hamilton uh, is F1. He's been F1 champion uh, if you follow motor racing. And uh, a pretty special man. But he's got this interesting connection. Uh, let me go ahead a couple. <laughs> He's got this interesting connection. One of his biggest sponsors is the bank. And uh, we don't have the bank here, I don't think. But um, banks, uh, banks want to be known as secure, don't they? Safe. Uh, not, not too risky. <laughs> Conservative. Why would they want to be associated with Lewis Hamilton, who lives right on the edge in a really high-risk, dangerous sport like motor racing? Have you thought about this? This happens. I, I discovered a new word this week called conflation. I don't know if you've come across it. But uh, conflation is when you try and fuse two ideas together that might not necessarily be the same, right? Why would a bank want to be associated with a really high risk, a person who works in a really high risk game? It's called conflation. They want you to feel excited about their bank. Motor racing's exciting. Lewis Hamilton's exciting. And it's quite hard to make your boring old bank look exciting. So they bring people in to do that. And you've, it, marketing is really where you see a lot of conflation. Uh, remember the tobacco ads? They're always associated with glamour. You, but it's really hard to find tobacco ads now, which is great. But all the, all the pictures of ads are on the internet are all old, you know, from the 50s. When they used to say, uh, more doctors smoke camel than any other brand, and, you know, crazy stuff like that. They try to try to conflate the idea, which is dangerous, with something good. Why do they do that? Let's go back to Disneyland. Disneyland, children, I should be asking you, what do you think of when you see Disneyland? You've never been there, probably. Has anyone been there? You have. What do you think of? What is Disneyland all about? Entertainment. Yeah. What did the kids say? Fun. Fun, yeah. Fun's a big word. It's all about fun, right? And the first guy you meet, one of the first guys you meet is this guy, right? He's all about, you know, he's always smiling. You notice that? The guy in that suit could be miserable, but Mickey's always smiling. Uh, fun. But really, it's about getting your money. And that's what most of the advertising, that's what most of the conflation that they do is um, about. These are the smoking ads. Look, to keep a slender figure, Reach for a lucky strike. More doctors smoke camels. But this is what they should really look like, right? For more information on lung cancer, keep smoking. Alcohol is very glamorous. These are the um, lies that are told through marketing. And... You know, even good things, it can be used for in a good purpose, like Rolex. That's a good watch. But do you need George Clooney to tell you about a good watch? Or Roger Federer? <laughs> so we get these faces with the products. Did you know, have you ever noticed in the Bible, Jesus resisted this kind of thing? Have a look, if you will, at... John 6. I've been wondering, actually, as we study the sanctuary, you know, 
It's uh, been great to get a deeper understanding of Jesus' great sacrifice for us. But I, I don't believe it's conflation how God used this little kind of sandbox model to teach us about his plan. It's not conflation. He didn't try and make something that didn't, something that said a different message to say something that, that the message he wanted. But look at John 6. You know the story of Jesus when he fed 5,000 people. We knew that was going to, he probably knew as well, that that was going to cause some problems. Do you know the problems it caused? Feeding 5,000 people all at once? Have a look at verse 14. After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who's come to, into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. If he'd wanted to be king, that would be the great, the right thing to do, right? Start feeding the people. He did want to be king, though. But he didn't want to be the king they wanted. <laughs> he wanted to be the king of their hearts and lives. He wanted to be king, their king personally. When evening came, in 16, his disciples went to the lake. And they walked on water. And he walked on water in that section there. And the next day, in 22, the crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore realized that only one boat had been there and that Jesus had not entered it with his disciples, but they'd gone on away alone then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there they got into boats and went to Capernaum in search of him and then when they found him you know this is a great crowd following him Jesus said this is a great way to market your kingdom right I tell you the truth, you're looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. And further, he had an argument with them about bread. <laughs> he said, he said, I'll give you bread, living bread. And they said, give it to us. He said, I am the bread. He said, uh, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they said, how can that happen? And you go further on down and it says, in 60, on hearing it, many of the disciples said, this is a hard teaching, who can accept it? And 61, aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit, and they are life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father enabled him. And here's the crunch, 66. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. So he wasn't doing real well on the marketing sort of program. Uh, he rejected that kind of thing. Remember the rich young ruler? In Luke 18, he said, Good master. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus immediately said, Why do you call me good? He resisted the praise of people for the wrong reason. You know the good Samaritan? Did you know Jesus never called him good? We did. We call him good. Jesus never called him good. There's a great example in Exodus of conflation. The, pe the children of Israel 
you know, Moses was up the mountain and uh, they started to wonder where he was. Exodus 32. I'll just read the first part. Exodus 32. You know the story. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Who were they worshipping? You're not sure? Who, was that? Who did they think they were worshipping? Yeah. See that in verse 5. This was a festival to the Lord. They were worshipping God. Afterwards they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. And you know what happened? God told Moses to go down and sort them out. Because they thought they were worshipping God, but God didn't think that. They'd mixed up the two ideas, you see. Because honour is always given on the terms of the person being honoured, not the one giving honour. Have you thought about that? When you go to have an audience with the Queen, she tells you how to behave. And uh, why would we think it was any different with God? The, um, I was reading this week, if you go for a papal audience to see the Pope, there's a very strict dress code. Ladies have to wear black skirt, a dress, I mean, and a black veil. Unless you're a Catholic queen, then you can wear white. But the queen, I noticed, I was looking for, because we've always understood, you know, the queen says how you dress. But they've actually, the, the head of the Anglican church has taken away the dress code. There's no real dress code anymore, which is very interesting. But even, you know, in your own terms, you decide what you're called, Right? I had a friend, uh, his, his name's James, and uh, when he was a little kid, his whole family called him Jimmy. And um, anyway, he went away as a young person. He kind of rebelled and, and uh, ran away, uh, basically, and spent most of his life living in pretty wild. But then when he got into his 40s, he found the Lord. Well, the Lord found him, you know. Anyway, uh, so he came back home and came back to the church, and he announced to his family... I want you to call me James. That's what my mother called me. That's my name. So everyone said, okay. But, they, you know, they've just, you know how it is. You just always call the person the right name. The same name you've always called them, right? So some of his family said, okay, we'll try. But one of his sisters said, no way. You'll always be Jimmy to me. Now, who, which one was giving him honour? Surely, when you want... You know, and when you go to meet someone, they say, what would you like to be called? <laughs> That's all to do with honour and worship. And, you know, when we come to God, this is why Seventh-day Adventists, we don't keep Saturday just because we're trying to be different, do we? <laughs> God said the seventh day is the Sabbath, and that's good enough for us. And, you know, you come along and say, well, this other day be all right? It seems completely false. Um, it's not giving him honour. So God's people, right through time, God's men, God's prophets, have always been led by God's word. When you read the stories of Elijah, the word of the Lord came to me. 
his whole life was directed by the, the word. The word of the Lord came to me and he went someplace and there was a lady whose boy had died, you know. There was a lady whose uh, food had run out. The word of the Lord came to me. And uh, so God's people have always been like that. But the world is in constant danger of confusion. So, you know, it's all around us. Jesus said, be careful, no one deceives you. And there's a big confusion, as we were seeing this morning. I appreciate Kevin. There's confusion over truth and error. And it will, it'll get worse. It's already getting worse, right? Mixing up truth and error. Mixing up Satan and God. Mixing up self with God. And I think of people like Elisha with Naaman the great military leader who was well respected he had leprosy his little servant his wife's little servant girl said she was an Israelite she said you should go down and see the prophet in Israel I know he can heal you so Naaman asked the king his master to give him a letter which he did and he sent it off to the king Israel's king the king of Israel said what I don't know how to heal people but his official said, send him, to the, send him to the Elisha. So Naaman gets in his chariot with a whole lot of reward, gold and silver and all sorts of clothing to take to this guy who was going to heal him. He pulls up outside his house. Elisha sent someone out to give him a message. He didn't even come out to say hello. Why do you think he did that? He never actually met Elisha. And would you be offended? He was offended. This guy won't even come and see me. He just gives me a message to go and wash in the river. And there's better rivers where I come from. So he was a bit grumpy. And yet his servants helped him out and said, Look, if he'd have told you to do some great thing, he would have done it. Why don't you just do what he says? So he did in the end. But see, Elisha was trying to avoid conflation. He didn't want to get him to get the idea that he could heal him. He wanted him to get the idea that God could heal him. And you notice it with Daniel. Remember the Nebuchadnezzar said, oh, I understand you can interpret dreams. He said, no, God can. Joseph was the same. I I can't interpret dreams. God can. And then Peter, you know, people used to um, people used to want to be healed. Of course, you'd want to be healed if someone can heal you, but they made sure all the time it's not anything I can do, but in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. So yeah, that's going to carry on we need an important we need to make an important distinction between truth and error and our correct picture of god right and how he works have a look in second thessalonians this is talking about our time i'm sure second thessalonians uh oh let me read Concerning the coming of the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ and our... Sorry, in chapter 2, I didn't tell you that. Second Thessalonians 2. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report or letter, supposed to have come from us, saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. And then he goes on to say, the coming, down in verse 9, the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs and wonders. Have you noticed how television's going? I don't get to see them, but I hear on the radio all the time about these new films, new television programs all about supernatural 
occult type things. A lot of it, a lot of it coming out now. And in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. That would be a good reason, wouldn't it? Satan wants to deceive people. They perish. Why? They refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe a lie. The lie. That's interesting, isn't it? They would believe the lie. (laughs) What is the lie? And so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. The lie is the same lie that started in Eden that I know better than God, isn't it? Remember Jacob? Jacob, Jacob's an amazing character. He, I would love to meet him and I look forward to meeting him. He, very intense person I think, uh, loved God deeply, wanted to carry the family birthright, you know, uh, he wanted to be the family spiritual leader. but And God had promised it to him, but he went about it in a sneaky way and uh, deceived his brother and deceived his father to get the birthright. And had a life of difficulty, didn't he? Had a life of difficulty. His, problem, his family problems were horrendous. You think we've got family problems now? He had big family problems. Four wives, I think, at least, and all the children from them, and they didn't like each other. Let's have a quick look at Jacob's story, Genesis 32, because it's a special one, and, and you notice his name comes up through Scripture. Right through Scripture, the, it talks about the God of Jacob. I wonder why Jacob? Why not the God of, you know, someone else? Genesis 32. He's getting ready to meet his brother. And he's terrified because he'd already, you know, he'd spent his life running from him, really, after deceiving him out of the uh, family jewels. And here he was on the other side of the river about to meet his brother, who was a pretty tough guy, I understand. So, we're coming down to, let me find the right verse. He told his people, he told his, um, he spent the night there, verse 13. And from what he had with him, he selected a gift for his brother Esau. 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 female camels with their young. 40 cows and 10 bulls. This sounds familiar, doesn't it? 20 female donkeys, 10 male donkeys. He put them in the care of his servants, each herd by itself, and said to the servants, go ahead of me and keep some space between the herds. You know, he's going to try and win his brother over. So the gifts went on ahead of him in verse 21, but he himself spent the night in the camp. That night Jacob got up, took his two wives his two maid servants, his eleven sons, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions, so Jacob was left alone. And you know what happened? A man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place. Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, yet my life was spared. He wasn't wrestling with a man, really. 
He was wrestling with God in the form of a man, Christ. And um, he gave him this name, the one who wrestled with God. The name means he struggled with God. Do you struggle with God? You know, the better you get to know God, the more you struggle with him. (laughs) The more questions you have, right? And I think about people like Job. Job struggled with God. Job was the richest man around, and he was the best guy too. Blameless. God called him blameless. And then, you see behind the scenes, I was reading Job again this morning. If you're ever discouraged, read Job. Job lost everything. But we get to see behind the scenes something that he didn't see. Satan. Demanding from God permission to harm Job because he said, that guy only serves you because you bless him. And God believed in Job enough to say, yes, go ahead. And so Job, you know, his friends come along. He's lost all of his children. He's lost all of his possessions. His wife even told him to give it up. And uh, he asked God why. His friends come along and say, man, you must have done something really bad. You shouldn't talk to God like that. And uh, they came to correct his thinking, you know. So let's have a look at chapter 32, 42, sorry. The last chapter, isn't it, of Job? And have a look at the end of the story. It's a great read. It's the oldest book, too, in the Bible, which is pretty significant. This is Job talking to God. I know that you can do all things... No plan of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. That's our problem, isn't it? You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you shall answer me. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Isaiah had the same experience. When he saw God, you know, he just finished telling Israel all the woes, woe to you and woe to you. And then he saw God and he said, woe to me. <laughs> Verse 7 of Job 42. After the Lord had said these things to Job, he said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, this is his friend, I am angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. So then he asked them to make a sacrifice. Job was the one arguing with God. These other guys were telling him to be more respectful. Job was the one God respected. Think about that in your own life. It's not wrong to wrestle with God. Jacob wrestled with God and got a new name. And who's Israel? Today. Let me have a look. Romans 9. Romans 9. 6 to 8. Romans 9, 6 to 8. It is not as though God's word had failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they... Uh, whose descendants are they all Abraham's children? On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it's not the natural children who are God's children, but it's the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. And Galatians 3, you know what it says? 29. If you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You're Israel. You're the people that struggle with God. 
And you'll find, like I said, the more you struggle, the more you get to know them, the more you struggle in a lot of ways. So what the other thing we learn from Job is something that he didn't know, is who's responsible for evil. And we've been learning about it in our lessons. Satan has to take responsibility in the end for all of the temptation and evil he's done in the world.